to got to unmute myself let's try that again welcome everybody to another episode of bread theory we're going to be continuing tonight with uh the audiobook version of what is communist anarchism which has also been published under the title the abc of anarchism it's by alexander berkman who was an anarchist um you know, prominent around uh, about a hundred years ago. This this book itself was was written almost a hundred years ago, um, but he lived uh, primarily in in the U.S. That's where he did most of his uh, political thinking, and then um, got deported basically to uh, what what turned into the USSR. So he went through the Russian Revolution. He he um, had a lot of hope for it at the beginning. Uh, that the that the um, Soviets would um, come up with a a more left wing, uh, um, I guess almost utopia, and he he became disillusioned after seeing how things turned out. So uh, the, the the chapter this week is on the Bolsheviki, and so we've we've gone through the interim period between the, the first revolution, the February revolution, and we're now coming up to the October revolution. So in the, in the interim period that the czar had been removed, uh, and they were, they were basically setting up what we might call a, a liberal democracy today, something similar to the U.S. So in other words, a, a bourgeois democracy uh, with a bunch of reformist policies. They, they reined in a lot of the, the left-wing actions that were taking place in terms of, of land reform um, and that sort of thing. And uh, and so the, the Bolsheviks thought, hey, we can do better. So they uh, launched their own revolution. It's, it's commonly known as the October Revolution. So I believe that's what we're going to be uh, talking about tonight. Let me just pull it up here. Okay, let me make sure I turn on the closed captionings. Oh, let's see. Before I get started, though, um, I have uh, set up a Patreon recently. I have a couple of members. Um, so thanks very much to John T. and Mike E. for being my, my first patrons. Uh, but if you like this sort of thing, if you like covering theory, and you want to, uh, you know, compensate me at all uh, for, for however much you think it's it's worth, to have this coming to you uh, every week, uh, it's it's definitely appreciated. I'm, I'm trying to get to the point where I can make streaming, you know, maybe a, a part-time career or maybe a career for, uh, you know, part of the year I'll, I'll do it full-time. Because um, I, I, I do landscaping in the summertime, so it would be great if I could just, you know, once the, once the snow starts flying, if I could settle into the, the chair here and, and, and just do that all winter long. That would be I mean, that would be amazing. Uh, but that, that, that is just a dream at this point, unless I have support from viewers like you. Uh, so consider donating if you can. If you can't, you can still support the stream by sharing this uh, to Facebook, Twitter, uh, wherever there is a social media platform that you can share stuff. Instagram, that's another good one, too. Um, or just, you know, send an, send an email even to uh, someone who you think might be interested in this sort of thing. And that would help out a lot. Um, also, I want to mention that on uh, my, I, I so I run two Facebook pages that are devoted to uh, leftist sort of thought. One is Left Pod Posting, or I, uh, I'm sorry, Left Pod Radio. Left Pod Posting is the the group that's associated with it, but the page is uh, Left Pod Radio, and right now in in both that on that page and on uh, LSB TV, which is Left Signal Boost TV. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to start up uh, what is more or less a content creator um, collective. So we, we on, on LSB TV, we have three of us right now who all, who all stream to that page and uh, looking for more people. So if you're a leftist creator, if you know of any of them, uh, send them over our way. That, that's uh, Left Signal Boost TV. And basically, the, the sign up process is pretty easy. 
and just give us a link to your content. And uh, assuming that we uh, deem it appropriate, like, like you're a good fit for us, then we will uh, set you up to stream from that page as well. And the idea being that we all kind of help uh, share in each other's growth. It's, it's a way that we've found so far that, that our audiences can kind of cross over between the, the, the various uh, people who are streaming there. And so that's for video creators. And then, then um, Left Pod Radio is for audio creators. So if you have a podcast, same, same sort of deal. Looking for, for people to um, stream their podcast or post links to their podcast from that page too. So that we can all kind of work together. You know, have a, in, instead of just being a very lonely kind of, you know, uh, business grind set almost to try and promote your own uh, content, just just have a place where we can all support one another. So if those if either of those things are interesting or yeah, interesting to you or, or some, of you know, uh, head on over to uh, Left Pod Radio or to Left Signal Boost TV, both on Facebook. So check them out. All right, well, let's get into the chapter tonight. And as always, um, any questions you have, uh, this, this is meant to be a very introductory text to, to what it means to be an anarchist. So don't, don't worry if, if your particular question is entry level because that's completely appropriate. I'm always here to, to help people understand leftist ideas better. All right, well, let's get going. Audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Yep, and as always, we're using the the Audible Anarchist um, YouTube channel. I'll give you a link to the, the video itself, too, in case you want to check it out on your own time. So, all right, here's tonight's video. There you go. Hey, Natalie, how you doing tonight? Good to see you. Okay, here we go. Why is it not playing? There we go. Chapter 16, the Bolsheviki. Who were the Bolsheviki and what did they want? Up to the year 1903, the Bolsheviki were members of the Russian Socialist Party, that is, the Social Democrats, followers of Karl Marx and his teachings. In that year, the Social Democratic Labor Party of Russia split on the question of organization and other minor matters. Under the leadership of Lenin, the opposition formed a new party which called itself Bolshevik. The old party became known as Menshevik. The Bolsheviki were more revolutionary than the mother party from which they seceded. When the World War broke out, they did not betray the cause of the workers and join the patriotic jingos, as did the majority of other socialist parties. To their credit, it can be said that, like most anarchists and left social revolutionists, the Bolsheviki opposed the war on the grounds that the proletariat had no interest in the quarrels of conflicting capitalist groups. When the February Revolution began, the Bolsheviki realized that the political changes alone would do no good, would not solve the labor and social problems. They knew that putting one government in place of another would not help matters. What was needed was radical, fundamental change. Though Marxists, like their Menshevik stepbrothers, believers... I think that should be... Uh... Explain a little bit more. He said that they, they knew that just putting one government in place of another would not be enough. At the same time, Lenin and, and his cohorts, they, they did want to have a government. They just wanted it to be a worker government. So a government that's oriented towards uplifting the workers over profit, over capital, over all that sort of thing. So I would take a little bit of issue with the way that, that Berkman... Uh, characterize that, but let's continue. In the theories of Karl Marx, 
The Bolsheviki did not believe with the Mensheviki in their attitude to the great upheaval. They scorned the idea that Russia could not have a proletarian revolution because capitalist industry had not developed there to its fullest possibilities. Okay, so now we see a split between the, the Bolsheviki and the Mensheviki. The Menshevists believed uh, what, what Karl Marx said, that basically you can't just go from you know, a, a largely peasant agrarian population to having a modern communist state or even a socialist state. Uh, you had to go through the process of developing capitalism first to get your industries going, to, you know, come up current with the Industrial Revolution. I mean, Russia at this time was was uh, not very technologically advanced, but that, that did change quickly. Um, and so, so Marx had, had had speculated that that perhaps there needed to be an interim period between monarchy and socialism. That you had to go through capitalism in order for there to be um, a strong enough working class and a strong enough class consciousness um, through things like labor organizing and that sort of thing. Um, and I mean, you, you take the long view of things the 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 USSR didn't last. I mean, it lasted for, what, uh, 70 years, something like that. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's not nothing, but ultimately it didn't have staying power. And, you know, there definitely were a lot of reasons for that, too. Of course, like many other socialist countries, the, the Western, you know, so-called liberal democracies were at Russia's throat, or the USSR's throat from the beginning, trying to topple their revolution. Um, and, you know, they, I mean, there, there's long, I mean, the whole Cold War took place during, during the, the entirety of, of uh, the USSR's existence. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard to pin it on any one thing, but perhaps if they had gone through a stage of, of capitalism, uh, maybe it would have been better. Maybe the people would have been more ready because that was another big problem that they struggled with was that a lot of the, the, uh, a lot of the people just weren't ready for that sort of a revolution and they, they resisted. Um, so they had resistance from within, they had, uh, you know, enemies from without, uh, it's hard to say though. But interest, interesting to see that there was that split there between um, the different factions. They realized that it was not merely a bourgeois political change that was taking place. Hi, James. They How knew you that the people were not satisfied with the abolition of the czar and not content with the constitution. They saw that things were developing further. They understood that taking of the land by the peasantry and the growing expropriation of the possessing classes did not signify reform. Closer to the masses than the Mensheviki, the Bolsheviki felt the popular pulse and more correctly judged the spirit and purpose of tremendous events. It was foremost of all Lenin, the Bolshevik leader, who believed that the time was approaching when he and his party might grasp the reins of government and establish socialism on the Bolshevik plan. Bolshevik socialism meant the seizing of political power by the Bolsheviki in the name of the proletariat. They agreed with the anarchists that communism would be the best economic system. That is, the land, the machinery, the production and distribution, and all public utilities should be owned in common excluding private possession in those things. But so an important uh, thing to define there, owned in common. Um, this can mean different things. This can mean owned by a, a you know, by the government and, and essentially controlled by the government. And as long as the people have direct control over the government, it's not that different than them owning it directly. This could mean that for each factory uh, or, or, each business itself, that the people who formerly were just workers became worker owners. Um, that that was more the the direction that like uh, Peter Kropotkin wanted things to move in, in a, in a 
revolutionary state um, uh, state of things, not like a, a political state. Um, so yeah, they, there was a lot of there's a lot of agreement between anarchists and uh, communists, um, as as we were learning in in the video over the weekend. Uh, another split is that, anar you know, they, they both want to have a stateless, classless, uh, moneyless society. And again, we see that the, the difference being, or one of the differences being, is uh, the process of getting there. Communists want to go through socialism first, and then develop it into to communism. And the anarchists wanted to leap straight to it. So again, you see the the difference in you know do we have to ha do we have to go through all these stages in order to achieve our end or can we just leap to the good stuff really? While the anarchists wanted the people as a whole to be the owners, the Bolsheviki held that everything must be held in the hands of the state, which meant the government would not only be the political ruler of the country but also its industrial and economic master. And, and again, I would say I would be fine with that sort of a system as long as the people had direct and meaningful control over the government. You know, as long as they were... Anyone was actually able to, to run for political office, as long as no one was paid an exorbitant wage for being a member, uh, an elected uh, official, and as long as any elected official could be recalled at any time with a, a simple majority vote from the people that elected them in the first place. That sounds like a great system. Um, but I, I, I'm not entirely sure that that's the way that it ended up working out. And, and that was, the I think, the intentions, too, of the Bolsheviks to, to have that sort of a system. And so in that case, it's not, you know, it, you might say there's a little bit more indirectness of... of how the, the people own the means of production. It's not as though, you know, it, it's, it's not the same as kicking out the boss and now we're going to run the machinery ourselves. It's more kicking out the boss and now we will elect representatives to represent us uh, in the government and then that government will centrally manage and, and control things. Um, pretty much the same thing thing in the end because you still end up having uh control over the means of production it's just does it go through the state or is it more direct the bolsheviki is met as marxists believed in a strong government to run the country with absolute power over the lives and fortunes of the people in other words the bolshevik idea was a dictatorship that dictatorship to be in the hands of themselves of their political party. They called such an arrangement the dictatorship of the proletariat. And so this stands in, in contrast to uh, what we have under liberal democracies, which is more or less a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, the, the ruling elite. You know, there, there's all sorts of window dressing to say, well, you know, nothing's preventing you from running for office, nothing's preventing you legally from participating in, in the uh, electoral system. Um, but the way that it ends up working out, it's, it's pretty much just the bourgeois who are in a position to be able to run for office, in a position to really influence power, you know, even through indirect means, through like lobbying, it's not as though uh, the working class in the U.S. has any sort of, you know, lobbyist that they hire. Uh, but plenty of rich people do. Plenty of business owners do. So, um, so yeah, an important contrast. So they wanted to have a worker state, a, a dictatorship of the proletariat. So it is more truly a government um, for, of, and by the people, rather than just a select few who were lucky enough to have power already. Because their party, they said, represented the best and foremost element, the advance guard of the working class, and that their party should therefore be the dictator in the name of the proletariat. 
The great difference between anarchists and Bolsheviki was that the anarchists wanted the masses to decide and manage affairs for themselves, through their own organization, without orders from any political party. They wanted real liberty and voluntary cooperation and joint ownership. The anarchists therefore called themselves free communists, or communist anarchists, while the Bolsheviki were compulsory, governmental, or state communists. So there's another important distinction there. Anarchism puts a lot of emphasis on free association, that you're never coerced to be part of any political body. Um, that, that you get to decide who, who you know who you collaborate with in, in business, who you collaborate with in making political decisions, um, all that sort of thing. And and the the communists didn't they wanted it to be more compulsory. So if you live within this region, within the confines of, of where the state draws its borders, then you were just de, you know de facto part of that that government. You live under that government. You participate in that government. You don't get to opt in or out. Um, there's definitely uh, arguments to be made in either direction. Um, I think, it, I mean, to me, it kind of seems like at the time, considering how many threats they already had um, and how many threats they faced soon after uh, defeating the, the, the current government, um, maybe it it would be true that that a more centralized state would be better equipped to deal with the, the kind of threats that they did face um maybe you can't just rely on people to spontaneously organize enough in order to to fend off those sorts of threats because that d that does depend on a lot of people being on the same page just of their own accord and and the way like kropotkin had conceived of it, um, he just thought that people would spontaneously take up defense because, you know, now the revolution is invested in them. They have all the, the, they have the means of production, they have material security, which they may never have had in their entire life. And uh, because of all that, they would want to, you know, viciously defend against anyone who would seek to, to topple that sort of thing. Um, so I think he had a point too. It just it it does depend on a lot of things just coming together uh, in order for it to all work in concert. Whereas with this centralized system, it can be more ordered that things come together for that purpose. The anarchists didn't want any state to dictate to the people, because such a dictation, they argued, always means tyranny and oppression. The Bolsheviki, on the other hand, while repudiating the capital. And, you know, up until that point, there was no real other example to even go by. Uh, there, there were not other socialist states at that time. So the, the, the history of, of statehood had pretty much been, in the Western world, just that, that, that it was always a concentration of power, and it was always people taking extreme advantage of their power to to ensure its continuation, even generation after generation. So they had good reason to to fear any concentration of power, even if it was supposedly controlled by the people. Um, and again, it might seem that that over time, the Soviet Union, even if it started off pretty well, because uh, at the beginning, when, when Lenin was still in control, I think, I think he was still in control at the time, uh, they did institute a lot of stuff. They, they, I think they were one of the earliest stations. Uh, they were one of the earliest um, um, states in the world to have any sort of protection and recognition of, of uh, LGBT individuals. Um, I think from the beginning they gave women the right to vote. So they instituted a lot of very progressive reforms right away. But then things kind of eroded over time. Um, but yeah, that, that's, for, that's for a later study. But the state and the bourgeois dictatorship 
wanted the state and the dictatorship to be theirs, of their party. You can see, therefore, that there is all the difference in the world between the anarchists and the Bolsheviki. So Natalie says, I'm curious, how would an anarchist view health care and its distribution? I don't know, really, their distinction from the li a libertarian view. And, and um, okay, so are you, are you talking about like a, like how would you think of libertarian in the U.S. and the U.S. only as, as a right-wing thing? Or are you thinking about uh, like libertarian socialist? So just so I can be clear. Um, but an anarchist would view health care as, as they would view pretty much any necessity of life, that it's something that is, that is just owed to people because they are alive and, and everyone is more or less equal, and that it should be given freely based on need. They, you know, they, they, both the anarchy, uh, oh, yeah. So it's definitely different than, than a right-wing libertarian. That's for sure. Libertarians don't care if you die in the gutter. If you don't got the money, you don't got health care. Uh, libertarians are very cold and cruel people and only believe in maximizing freedom uh, from a very individualist point of view. So, like, they would conceive of, of freedom as, 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 you know, a very personal thing. It's like, what am I allowed to do? Can I run my business how I want? Can I have a control over my entire business myself? Uh, can I decide where the profits go? Can I choose, you know, everything to do with my business without any sort of government interference or very limited? You know, I, I think most libertarians would still recognize that, that the government is needed for things like contract law. Uh, otherwise, people would just be scamming each other. And I guess, <laughs> I mean, if you look at the, the way that the NFT market is going, then then maybe they don't even believe in that and they because uh, so many of them do tend to, or do turn out to be just scams and they still are all about the nfts but that you know aside from that a, a right libertarian believes uh, again it's, it's how much how much health care can i get you know i, I don't want to be limited in the amount of health care that i can personally get but it always is it, it's it's maximizing in a way that doesn't really think about other people. So it's it's how much freedom can I have to run my own business, regardless of how that that running affects the workers. How much healthcare can I get, regardless if other people are are you know dying on the streets of preventable disease. It's it's how much can I get, and if I am limited personally in any way, then that's bad. Um, that's, that's the right libertarian conception of things, more or less. And so the opposite would be true for an anarchist or, or a socialist or libertarian socialist, left-wing libertarian. Uh, yeah, well that, so, so you say you've seen other people claiming to be an anarchist who support what seems to be a selfish view towards others. Again, the, the, the you know, the, the right-wing libertarians were very deliberate in stealing a lot of terms from the left. Um, Murray Rothbard talked about this a lot, how he, he stole a libertarian from the left wing. And then also we have so-called anarcho-capitalists, which is a contradiction in terms, unless you don't care about private hierarchy. You're like, Hierarchy's ter hierarchy is terrible. It's not justified unless it's my business. And in that case, it's infinitely justified. And if anyone doesn't like it, they can go elsewhere. That's your freedom. You know, freedom for other people is always going somewhere else as though everyone just has an equal ability to find a different healthcare provider if they don't like theirs or find different employment if their their employment is insufficient they they seem to think that people have in, just an inexhaustible ability to make choices as it is so so yeah if anyone ever says anarcho capitalist or in the US if they say libertarian you got to think twice before you, you lump them in with anything that's on on the left um but libertarians started off as a left-wing terminology it was about maximizing the freedom for as many people as possible 
balancing that with everyone else's freedom to do the same. So instead of how, how can I, you know, how much freedom do I have to run my personal business, regardless of how it affects others, it's how much control do I have over my own workplace in balance with other people's ability to control that same workplace. So it would be things like having a, a, you know, a worker owned cooperative where everyone has a democratic and equal vote for the important matters like setting wages, setting hours, setting benefits, um, deciding how, uh, uh profits are, are invested. Um, or not, if they're, if they're paid out as bonuses, all that sort of thing. The, the libertarian socialist or the, the anarchist way of, of looking at that would be to balance rights. Rights, can, you know, it's, uh, it's very much, you know, see, you, can, you can see this play out in, in the debate over things like COVID, where you have one group of people that understands pretty clearly that decisions they make about their own health can also affect other people negatively. So if they don't, if I don't protect myself, which I am, I'm vaxxed and boosted. I have all my, my shots that I have available to me right now. And a big reason for that is because I understand that if I don't protect myself and I get sick, I, I run the risk of spreading it to other people. And if they're not protected at all, then they run the risk of, well, dying. I mean, 95% of the cases of COVID, that 95% uh, of the people that are dying of, of COVID right now are unvaccinated. So I don't want to do that. I understand that my freedom can also affect others. And then you have the other side of that, that, that debate who's just like, who, again, only sees it as their own personal freedom. I should have the right to choose about medic, you know, my medical care. It's my, 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 me, 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 me. And they don't conceive of the idea that if they don't, again, if they don't protect themselves, that can affect other people negatively too. So you can see that, that split playing out right now. Um, but anarchists would always be on the side of, trying to understand how exercising their freedoms could negatively impact the freedoms of other people to exercise those same freedoms. Whether it's the workplace, whether it's personal life, whether it's in government, the idea is to spread out power and spread out freedom as much as possible. All right, let's continue on in the chapter here. Thank you very much for the question though, Natalie. That's very good. Uh, James says people should have health care, food, shelter, and guns. Yeah, I don't have a problem with, with people having guns. That, that definitely has a position is a position that it's taking me time to, to come around on because I, I would see all the, the terrible things about, um, you know, school shootings, mass shootings of, of all sorts. Um, guns are, are, are a very powerful tool. At the same time, they have been an important part of a lot of fights uh of resistance even in this country um the the uh the i think it was the second rise of the the kkk during the civil rights era uh they would go on these these night rides and just shoot at at black people's houses and the police obviously were not getting themselves involved with it. In fact, probably the police were part of those people doing that. So they didn't really have any other recourse. And and the, the deacons for, I always forget their, their name exactly, but it's something like the demon, uh, the deacons for self-defense. Let me look them up right quick. The space bar would be good. Deacons for Defense and Justice, which actually there's a, a 2003 film about, organized themselves. Uh, they, they got together with a bunch of guns and they would protect these people's houses when no one else would. And so you got to admit that in that in that scenario, without the guns, those people would have been 
you know, uh, completely vulnerable to the whims of the KKK. Same sort of thing happened after Katrina. Before the waters receded completely, before uh, the police were able to come back in and restore order, um, there was a time when, when a lot of the people that were not able to leave for whatever reason uh, were, at, again, at the mercy of a bunch of white supremacists who would drive around once again in their trucks and, you know, brandished their guns at people. I think they actually shot uh, a few people until the, um, oh, and I, uh, the name escapes me. What was the name again? It's uh, Mutual Aid Disaster Relief. Actually, let me let me give you a link for those those Deacons for Defense and Justice. I'll just give you the Wikipedia for it first, just so you can have some more info on that one. And then we'll look up uh, Mutual Aid Disaster Relief. So mutual aid disaster relief got a got a call from from these people who were being terrorized by these white supremacists after after Katrina. And they came in again with their guns and they didn't have any any firefights or anything but just making their presence known showing the 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 white supremacists that that you know they weren't going to push back if they started any more trouble um, was enough. They, they, they didn't harass anyone after that point. So again, it's hard to say that, that there's no justification for guns. I mean, there, there, there is, and that's when the law will not protect you. Um, so yeah, anyway, a little bit of a, a sidebar there, but that's fine. Let's continue on with the, uh, with the chapter here. The anarchists are opposed to all government. The Bolsheviki are for strong government on condition that it is in their hands. They are not against the big stick, as a clever friend of mine is wont to say. They only want to be on the right end of it. <laughs> but the Bolsheviki realized that the views and methods advocated by the anarchists were sound and practical, and that only such methods could assure the success of the revolution. They decided to make use of anarchists idea, anarchist ideas for their own purposes. So it happened that although the anarchists themselves were too weak in numbers to reach the math, masses, they succeeded in influencing the Bolsheviki, who presently began to a advocate anarchist methods and tactics, pretending, of course, that they were their own. But they were not their own. You might say it does not matter who advocates or helps carry out so you say law, law can't protect you when there's more thugs than regular people. Um, I think the law is is selective much more than, than most Americans would like to admit about who it protects and what it protects. Um, it's the reason you see that uh, during civil unrest, it's always the poorest parts of town that, that end up getting the, the brunt of the damage while the richer parts are protected literally protected in, in many cases by police barricades and curfews and, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. An idea that will benefit the people. But if you think it over a bit, you will realize that it matters very much, as all history and particularly the Russian Revolution proves. It matters because everything depends on the motives, on the purpose and spirit in which a thing is carried out. Even the best idea can be applied in such a manner as to bring much harm. Agree with that, Because James. the masses, fired by the great idea, may fail to notice how, in what manner, and by what means it is being carried out. But if carried out in the wrong spirit or by false means, 
even the noblest and finest idea can be turned to the ruin of the country and its people. That is just what happened in Russia. The Bolsheviki advocated and partly carried out anarchist ideas. But the Bolsheviki were not anarchists, and they did not at heart believe in those ideas. They used them for their own purposes, purposes that were not anarchistic, that were really anti-anarchistic, against the anarchist idea. What were those Bolshevik purposes? The anarchist idea was to do away with oppression of every kind, to abolish the rule of one class over another, to substitute the management of all things for the mastery of man over man, to secure the liberty and well-being for all. Anarchist methods were calculated to bring about such a result. The Bolsheviki... I just want to point out that, that little all for all that uh, he just put in there. That That's definitely a callback to uh, Peter Kropotkin. I'm pretty sure he was the, the pioneer of that phrase. The idea that because we're all beneficiary, beneficiaries of, of countless generations in terms of the knowledge that we have, the, the material comfort that we have, um, the technology and abilities that we have, all, all that sort of thing, because all of us are beneficiaries of that, we are all due the, the, um, the I guess, the spoils of that, the intellectual, the cultural, uh, the technological spoils of all of that. So it's not okay for certain among us to just cordon off a bunch of that, that gain from what is really a collective effort over, you know, hundreds, thousands of years. And, and also uh, pretty much all progress is, is built off the, the progress from the past as well. So even things like te technological development comes from building off of technology that was developed before, you know, the person who's now the new inventor was uh, even born. Uh, so it's not, it's not right for us, a handful of people to then, again, cordon off that, that, that uh, te technological or intellectual property. All was due for all used the anarchist methods for an entirely different purpose. They did not want to abolish political domination and government. They only meant to get it into their own hands. Their object was, as already explained, to gain control of political power by their party and establish a Bolshevik di dictatorship. It is necessary to get this very clearly in order mm -hmm. to understand what happened to the Russian Revolution and why the proletarian dictatorship quickly became a Bolshevik dictatorship over the proletariat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have made this analysis of the way things went down. It's hard for me to even have a, a firm enough opinion on it because I just, I just haven't studied it closely enough, I don't think, or extensively enough. Uh, but the narrative goes, and, and Berkman is one more voice adding to that that narrative that the Bolsheviks started with very high-minded ideas of really sharing power as equally as possible with all of the proletariat. So even if they came and, and set up the apparatus of the new worker state, all the power would then be given to the people. And it would run in, in much the way that, that Lenin had talked about it running in State and Revolution. But at that critical time when they seized power, they decided to set up it themselves in the places of power. And, and there could be many reasons for that. Perhaps they didn't think that the, the average peasantry was, was uh, you know, ready for that sort of responsibility yet. Perhaps they, they just wanted to make sure that things got set up right, and they really did intend to then cede power back to the people at large. Um, or perhaps they had nefarious purposes. I mean, there probably was a big mix of that amongst all of them as well. I, I would doubt that every single Bolshevik had the same intentions going into it. So probably some of them did do it just to seize power for themselves and then do, uh, you know, 
maybe a kinder, gentler version of 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 uh, what had happened in the past in in terms of uh, one class ruling another, but nonetheless, not do away with classes altogether. Um, so it's a it's a complex issue, and and definitely we should explore it more. Um, I think. Uh, so, so Alexander Berkman, the one who we're reading right now, was good friends with Emma Goldman. And I can't remember if it was her or him who wrote an entire book on their experience uh, and their, their uh, disappointment with the, the Bolshevik Revolution. Might be a good one to explore someday, though. But there's a lot of more authors I want to get to before that point. Um, in fact, I was reading some... Uh, Mao earlier, like a day or two ago, and he he has some really good short essays. So I think probably after we're, we're done with Berkman here, we'll probably go back to um, a communist point of view and and read some Mao. And then um, Murray Bookchin has a really good short essay. Uh, it was it was one that was actually responsible for. Um, the the change of heart that the leader of uh, the Rojavans and I, and I, there's so many acronyms when it comes to Rojava that I don't know which one to use, so I just say Rojava for you know for convenience sake. But anyway, um, Abdullah, I think it was Abdullah Akula. Uh, it's Ajlan, Ajlan. That's how it's supposed to be pronounced. Uh, he was in prison, read some Murray Bookchin, and had a change of heart. He was a leftist to begin with, but he was more of a, what you would call an authoritarian, right? And I think that term gets, uh, I think it's had too much baggage applied to it. So, um, but for lack of a better term, uh, term he was more on, on that side of things. And then switched over to the, the anarchist way of thinking after reading Murray Bookchin. And, and so we'll look at... What was the name of it? I'm not quite sure off the top of my head. Um, yeah, so I think maybe we'll do some essays for a while after we do, after we finish up with, with Berkman here, just to get some more variety, get some more back and forth between um, the two major uh, schools of thought in leftism. It was soon after the February Revolution that the Bolsheviki began to proclaim anarchist principles and tactics. Among these were direct action, the general strike, expro expropriation, and similar modes of action by the masses. As I have said, the Bolsheviki, as Marxists, did not believe in such methods. At least they had not believed in them until the Revolution. For years previously, socialists everywhere, including the Bolsheviki, had ridiculed the anarchist advocacy of the general strike as the strongest weapon of the workers in their struggle against the capitalist exploitation and government oppression. And so there's another term that, that is probably worth uh, getting into a little bit more, and that's the, the general strike. So you may be familiar with particular uh, businesses or particular industries even going on strike um let's see we had the kellogg strike over the over the summer uh so that's one type of strike a general strike is basically all workers collectively using their their power to to refuse to work um in order to basically take down the entire system and and you know not really put anything in its place necessarily, but but definitely take the means of production for themselves. Um, that that's definitely that that is one way that the the general strike can can play out. It can also be used just as a, a tool to get specific concessions uh, without trying to take down the entire government all at the same time. The general strike as general nonsense was the war cry of socialists against the anarchists. Socialists did not want the workers to resort to direct mass action and the general strike because it might lead to revolution. 
and to the taking of things into their own hands. The socialists wanted no independent revolutionary action by the masses. They advocated political activity. They wanted the workers to put them, the socialists, in power so that they could do the revolutionizing. If you glance over the socialist writings for the past 40 years, you will be convinced that socialists were always against the general strike and direct action, as they were also opposed to expropriation and revolutionary syndicalism, which is another name for the worker Soviets. Socialist congresses passed drastic resolutions and socialist agitators agitators fiercely denounced all such revolutionary tactics. But the Bolsheviki accepted these anarchist methods and began advocating them with newborn conviction. Not of course at the outbreak of the revolution in February 1917. They did it much later when they saw that the masses were not content with mere political change and were demanding bread instead of a constitution. The swiftly moving events of the revolution compelled the Bolsheviki to fall in line with the most radical popular aspirations in order not to be left behind in the revolution, as happened to the Mensheviki, to the right socialist revolutionists, the constitutional democrats, and to other reformers. Very sudden was this Bolshevik acceptance of anarchist methods, because only a short time before they had been insistently calling for the Constituent Assembly. For months following the February Revolution, they were demanding the convocation of a representative body to determine the form of government that Russia was to have. It, it was right for the Bolsheviki to favor the Constituent Assembly, since they were Marxists and pretended to believe in majority rule. The Constituent Assembly was also to be elected by the entire people, and the majority of the, the assembly was to decide matters. But the real reason why the Bolsheviki agitated for the assembly was that they believed that the masses were with them, and that they, the Bolshevik party, would be sure of a majority in the assembly. Presently, however, it became clear that they would prove an insignificant minority in that bar body, their hope to dominate it vanished. As good governmentalists and believers in majority rule, they should have bowed to the will of the people, but that did not suit the plans of Lenin and his friends. They looked about for other ways of getting control of the government, and their first step was to begin a vehement agitation against the constituent assembly. To be sure, the assembly could give nothing of value to the country. It was a mere talking machine lacking all vitality, and unable to accomplish any constructive work. The revolution was a fact outside and independent of the constituent assembly, independent of any legislative or governmental body. It began and was developing in spite of government and constitution, in spite of all opposition, in defiance of law. In its entire character, it was unlawful, non-governmental, and even anti-governmental. The revolution followed the healthy, natural impulses of the people, their needs and aspirations. In the truest sense, it was anarchistic in spirit and deed. Only the anarchists, those governmental heretics who believed in liberty and pop popular initiative as the cure for social ills, welcomed the revolution as it was and worked to further its growth and deepening so as to bring the entire life of the country within its sphere of influence. So Natalie says, uh, there are some on the left planning a general strike for May 1st this year. I haven't heard about that one yet. Uh, it's not the first attempt, and I support it, yet so far has not had the amount of uh, the numbers to, to make a difference in getting the attention needed. Yeah, there's, there's just too few of us right now uh the left is is a pretty small shadow of what it was uh, even back during the, the height of the union era so i i, I mean it's definitely growing now uh and and not for no reason either it's it's definitely because of the material conditions getting worse for the average person and them looking for 
some sort of relief. Um, but yeah, the, the people that are that are on board with anything like a general strike are very few and far between. Because those who who even might be interested in leftism, uh, there's there's so much stigma that's been heaped up against, uh, well, especially like communists. Like any anything that the right doesn't like is is now communist, including <laughs> including Joe Biden. Like who they who you know it and the right's enemies are always simultaneously completely ineffective and completely powerful. And unstoppable so you know that they'll post in, in, in like the same day I've, I've seen it happen where they'll post a meme about how Joe Biden has brought this country down faster than any president in world history and also that he's a do-nothing president <laughs> but he's also a communist uh, yeah it's there's there's no the <laughs> America is so uh, inoculated against leftism, just through our education system, through, you know, through popular culture. Um, I mean, it, most most people on the right can't even define what socialism is. Uh, they just say, well, it, it basically always boils down to the government doing things and having stuff. It's like what Richard Wolff made fun of. It's like, you know, when the, when the government does stuff, that's socialism. And when it does a lot of stuff, that's communism. Um, they make funny cartoons about everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we have a long way to go. And that's, I mean, that's the main reason why I do this channel and have been doing it for about a year now. I must be coming up on my year anniversary, in fact. I, I, I may have passed it, even. I'll have to look back and let me see when I put out my very first video. Let's go back in time. All right. Oh, February 13th. How about that? Coming up on one year since my very first uh, live stream. That's cool. Very interesting. Also coming up on my, my 100th video. I think I'm up to 90... 90 something? I don't know. Maybe it'll say my dashboard there. How many I have? Oh, I have 94 subscribers too. Very cool. How many videos do I have? Not sure. What was my warning for? Oh, yeah. Wait, what? No, I'll deal with that stuff later. Um, yeah, Biden, Akami. Yeah, if only. Uh, and, we, and, you know, uh, as, as my wife and I are doing our taxes now, we, we found out that that stimulus was not so much a stimulus as just a loan to ourselves for the future. So both of us are going to get a lot less back because of the stimulus. So the one thing that I, that I held up Biden is like, at least he did that, was not really anything. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have Trump Republicans on, on Amanda's side, for sure. Although they don't vote, so it's, it's mostly just meme sharing with them. Um, we need to end the, the two-party system. No more picking between douchebag and bag of douche, yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah, the, I mean, the Republicans do nothing but hold the entire country back and accumulate more power at the top. And the Democrats do a lot of that, too. They just also 
are nice about it and once in a while pass something that, that actually helps average people. But they haven't passed much of anything this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Child tax credit was not a stimulus either because it, it's being taken out of your taxes again. Like, uh, it's so ridiculous. It's just so ridiculous. Um. All right, let's get back to the, the, the chapter. All other parties, including the Bolsheviki, had the sole object of lassoing the revolutionary movement and tying it to their particular bandwagon. The Bolsheviki needed the support of the masses to wrest the political power for their party and to proclaim communist dictatorship. Seeing that there was no hope in accomplishing this through the Constituent Assembly, they turned against it joined the anarchists in condemning it, and later forcibly dispersed it. But you can see that while anarchists could do this honestly, in keeping with their non-government ideas, similar action on the part of the Bolsheviki was a rank hypocrisy and political trickery. Together with their opposition to the Constituent Assembly, the Bolsheviki borrowed from the anarchist arsenal a number of other militant tactics, Thus they proclaimed the great war cry, all power to the Soviets, advised the workers to ignore and even defy the provisional government, and to resort to direct action to carry out their demands. At the same time, they also adopted the anarchist methods of the general strike and energetically agitated for the expropriation of the expropriators. It is important to keep in mind that these tactics of the Bolsheviki were not, as I have already pointed out, the logical outcome of their ideas, but only a means of gaining political confidence of the masses with the object of achieving political domination. Indeed, those methods were really opposed to Marxist theories and were not believed by the Bolsheviki. It was therefore not surprising that once in power, they repudiated all those anti-Marxist ideas and tactics. The anarchist mottos proclaimed by the Bolsheviki did not fail to bring results. The masses rallied to their flag. From a party with almost no influence with its main leaders, Lenin, Zinoviev, discredited and in hiding, with Trotsky and others in prison, they quickly became the most important factor in the movement of the revolutionary proletariat. Attentive to the demands of the masses, particularly the soldiers and workers, voicing their needs with energy and persistence, the Bolsheviki constantly gained greater influence among the people and in the Soviets, especially in those of Petrograd and Moscow. The inactivity of the provisional government and its failure to undertake any important changes aggravated the general dissatisfaction and resentment which were soon to break into fury. The pusillanimous character of the Kerensky regime served to strengthen the hands of the Bolsheviki in the Soviets. Daily rupture between the latter and the government grew, presently developing into open antagonism and struggle. The evident helplessness of the government, the decision of Kerensky to renew an aggressive movement at the front, together with the reintroduction of the death penalty for mil military desertion, the persecution of the revolutionary elements, and the arrest of the, their leaders all hasten the crisis. On July 3rd, 1917, thousands of armed workers, soldiers, and sailors demonstrated in the streets of Petrograd in spite of government prohibition. You gonna come join? Yeah. Oh, cool. Amanda's gonna come join us for the stream. You got enough room for your chair? No. Oh, no. Yeah. Ooh, I, can't, I don't know if I can move over anymore. Why is it so hot in here? Because the window's not open? Do you want me to open the window for you? Yeah. Okay. Hey, you everybody. Want... Yeah, you go I'm ahead and say hi. What's up? Headphones. Nope. Get my mouse caught up uh -oh. in there. That's good. People leaving already? Just kidding. No. I'm sure we'll get more people. 
minute. Need some room to be able to get to the window. Hey, everybody. Let's see. You can tell them about how come our room is so freaking hot all the time. Oh, we live in hell. That's why it's so hot. Don't, 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 don't. Oh, sorry. Stop. I thought I was helping. Let's see. On should have never called the child tax credit. Bear. Yes, they shouldn't have called it that. They shouldn't have called the other check a stimulus check either. I didn't realize I'd taken a personal loan out myself to be paid back later. Yeah. I would have never accepted it. This is definitely me not being butthurt about trying to start my taxes. And as soon as I accepted that piece of information, my return drastically decreased. Lies. I know. What a, what a ripoff, huh? I don't take kindly to it. Stimulus. Stimulate this. <laughs> oh. I didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, you're not on camera. No, I am. Just a little bit. They can't handle it. There thing. you are. <laughs> uh, so yeah, for those of you that don't know, uh, uh, Amanda's my wife. And she joins her sometimes to give her two cents and provide the, the color commentary. It's my goal in life. So I have to exercise so much self-control at work that I have none at home. Right, James? Didn't they just deposit it for everyone? Uh, that's how yeah. I remember it going. So yeah, a, a, a non-voluntary loan from my future self. Yeah, future me is a bitch. Thanks a lot, government. Uh, all right, let's continue on. Oh. oh. Oh, did you have more you wanted to say? I have a lot more I want to say about that, okay, but well, I'll continue. We'll, we'll, let it, we'll let it come through <laughs> as it does. So we're talking about the Russian Revolution now. And, and Berkman, um, I believe he witnessed it firsthand because I think he was back in Russia at that point. He was born there and then he was later deported because of his anarchist uh, organizing from the U.S. to Russia, which, which became the USSR. So we went through already how um, in, in his conception of things or his account of things, uh, the the Bolsheviks were the ones who, that that read the that led the uh, Soviet Revolution, or the revolution that that was what became the Soviet Union. Um, used a lot of anarchist tactics and slogans and that sort of thing, but then as soon as they got more power, they kind of dropped that all aside mm -hmm. and just kind of did whatever they felt like, without much consultation from. Uh, the people. We, we don't care what the people want. <laughs> Let's keep going. Demanding all power to the Soviets. Kerensky sought to suppress the popular movement. He even recalled trusted res regiments from the front to teach the proletariat of Petrograd a salutary lesson. But in vain were all the efforts of the bourgeoisie represented by Kerensky by the social democratic leaders and right socialist revolutionists to stem the rising tide. The July demonstrations were suppressed, but within a short time, the revolutionary movement swept the provisional government away. The Petrograd Soviet of soldiers and workers declared the government abolished and Kerensky saved his life only by fleeing in disguise. The masses backed the Petrograd Soviet the example of the capital was soon followed by Moscow, thence spreading throughout the country. It was on October 25th that the provisional government was declared abolished, its members arrested, and the Winter Palace was taken by the Military Revolutionary Committee of the Petrograd Soviet. On the same day, the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets opened its sessions. Political government was practically abolished in, in Russia. All power was now in the hands of the workers, soldiers, and peasants, represented in Congress. The latter immediately began to consider steps to carry out the will of the masses, to terminate the war, secure land for the peasants, the industries for the workers, and establish liberty and welfare for all. 
This was the status of the Russian Revolution in October 1917. Beginning with the abolition of the Tsar, it gradually widened and developed into a thorough industrial and economic reorganization of the country. The spirit of the people and their needs marked out further progress of the revolution toward rebuilding life on the foundation of political freedom, economic equality, and social justice. This could be accomplished only as the previous great changes from February to October had been, by the joint effort and free cooperation of the workers and peasants, the latter now joined by the bulk of the army. But such a development did not come within the scheme of the Bolsheviki. As already exclaimed, their aim was to establish a dictatorship wielded by their party. But a dictatorship means dictation, the imposing of the ruler's will upon the country. The Bolsheviki now felt themselves strong enough to carry out their real object. They dropped their revolutionary and anarchist mottos. There must be a vigorous political power, they declared, to carry on the work of the revolution under the guise of pr protecting the people against monarchists and the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie they began to use repressive measures. As a matter of fact, there were no czarist supporters or monarchists in Russia worth mentioning. The people had grown out of czarism, and there was no more chance whatever for a monarchy in Russia. As to the bourgeoisie, there had never been any organized capitalist class in Russia, such as we have in the highly developed industrial countries of the United States, England, France, and Germany. The Russian bourgeoisie was small in numbers and weak. It continued to exist after the February Revolution only under the protection of the Kerensky government. The moment the latter was abolished, the bourgeoisie went to pieces. It had neither the strength nor the means to stop the confiscation of its lands and factories by the peasants and workers. Strange as it may seem, it is a fact that throughout this whole period of revolution, the Russian bourgeoisie did not make any organized and effectual attempt to regain its possessions. Consider how different it would have been in America. There the capitalists who are strong and well organized would have offered the greatest resistance. They would have formed defense bodies to protect themselves and their interests by force of arms. I have no doubt they will do so when things begin to happen there as they did in Russia in 1917. Mm. They already do. It's called the police. Uh, yeah, definitely. And uh, if you look at the, the breakdown of, of world uh, police by, by, by country, I think... Uh, I'm sorry, world military by country. I think the U.S. police force is something like number 10 in terms of world militaries. That's gross. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, I think he's spot on there. Uh, I, I think if there was some sort of violent revolution to happen like tomorrow, uh, it's going to be the police and the military putting it down very quick. Like, like imagine that the, the January 6th uh, rioters had, had been at all successful in, in taking over the Capitol. You know, imagine they had actually taken hostage any of the... the members of Congress and really disrupted things, it wouldn't have been long before the military moved in and, and probably killed them all. <laughs> Although it's hard to know because they were right wing, so maybe they would have just negotiated with them and, and let them go, but that's beside the point. They would never take over government completely. You can't do it that way in the U.S. unless perhaps you have the support of the military. You, you'd have to have a lot of backing from uh, at least one of the branches of, of the military. Otherwise, you'd just be slaughtered, you know, if you're in some sort of open revolution. Uh, America is the world police, and they use no-knock warrants on other countries. So <laughs> that's, that's funny, but sad and true. That's true. Yeah, uh, and, and, and corporate interests own the media, too. Uh, you know, people are always banging on about uh, the mainstream media. Well, who owns the mainstream media? Me! It's, it's a handful of corporations own, you know, 
CNN and then the, the network news stuff and then Fox News, all of it's corporate owned. There's very little widespread or widely consumed news that is independent in any meaningful way. So yeah, they would have that backing as well. Uh, and already they, they have no trouble or, or compunction about spreading pop, uh, you know, anti-leftist propaganda about any country that the U.S. is involved with. So they definitely would be doing that if someone tried to have an uprising here. So that, that seems like that avenue of revolution is completely closed in the U.S., at least as things currently stand. It would take a massive weakening of the U.S. military or just the U.S. economy in general. We basically have to already be in collapse as a nation for that sort of thing to work. January 6th. Well, I was just talking about January 6th and that it... I just right. got here. I was like a couple seconds ago, Bear. Um, anyway, the January 6th, I, I just said, I guess you weren't paying attention to me, thanks. But uh, imagine if the January 6th rioters had mm-hmm. had more accomplished their goals. Had they, had they really taken over the Capitol building and held it for a while? Had they held Congress people hostage? Mm-hmm. They would have been swiftly executed by by military forces, or or for do one, you think so though? Well, uh, right. They they may have been let go, but still, they wouldn't have been allowed to keep that position. They couldn't have they couldn't have just installed Trump as like you know God Emperor, because the military was not on their side. But. They didn't do a very good job of trying to stop anybody, and that's all I'm going to say. So, yeah, so, yeah, some of the local police were definitely sympathetic to them. But in general, if the, the military had to be called in, that would have been game over for them. That would have been game over for them. I mean, I yeah. If, if, just... if there's anything that the current system will not stand, it's, it's you know, jeopardizing itself you know it's, it's it's letting itself be opened up to uh being taken over by anybody well the patriot yeti was there and he's up on a lot of charges now so that was yeah yeah he was their scapegoat you know the, yeah. the one that they made an example of uh but even he had had an incredibly short sentence compared to you know people who get taken up for drug charges or mm-hmm. human trafficking you know all sorts of really heinous things that go beyond just yelling drug yelling drug and it's really heinous though oh okay let's, I meant... let's go human trafficking human trafficking okay. sure <laughs> the point being so so more and less heinous crimes get get treated uh more harshly than than he was treated it's well, yeah, because they, they had a lot of sympathy for the, the protesters. They just couldn't openly say it. But anyway. Like, oh, I'm sorry about your feelings. Why don't you go attack the Capitol? But don't. Yeah, I mean, of course Trump wasn't going to show up because he always has to have one feet in, one foot in, in plausible deniability just in case his, his little operation didn't work out, which it didn't. So then he can, can then distance himself, but not not, not really. Right. Uh, so, so... D Nord says hostile takeover of the media and the government. Everyone complains, even Trumpers, but no one has done anything to enforce antitrust laws. Yeah, and they're probably not going to. Uh, the Democrats really like the status quo, more or less, with perhaps some some change out in people in charge. But they they really love the system. They're comfy. I mean, Pelosi talks all the time about how she's not going to make any sort of move to restrict insider trading among congress people and their their spouses because she profits billion or millions off of that pelosi needs to go <laughs> well yeah of course she needs to go rank I mean, or not rank choice term limits term limits would be great term limits on all of them i don't care you could switch right. departments that's fine but here's the thing but babe. you ain't gonna sit in that spot for 50 years and twiddle your thumbs and it would catch take- a big check it no, would, no. What? It would take a massive amount of, of public support for and, and pressure for that to ever go through. 
that the Democrats are not going to jeopardize their position. The Republicans certainly aren't going to jeopardize their position. They can hardly win unless they structure things in a way that that's basically cheating. Um, Fine, I'll get on the school board and I'll work my way up. Okay, you go ahead and do it. But <laughs> the point... A little faith this man has in me, jeez. In one person uh, uh, instituting term limits for U.S. Congress people? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not likely to happen. We're not likely to get ranked choice voting nationwide. Ranked choice voting is a good we're, idea. We're not likely to ever get proportional representation. We're, we're not likely to get any sort of extra democratic measures. I mean, it's all they can do to stop them from illegally purging voter rolls days before elections. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. And, and, and the Democrats are comfortable. The Republicans want to claw back even more power for themselves. There's no Democrats in this country. It's like diet Republicans. Well, I would say there's some that, that are ideologically... Same intent, less sugar. More better than others you know i don't think bernie oh so so you're against bernie now too it was a joke of course i sure. like bernie right but him and his his ilk are uh are very small in in power and in in numbers i don't care i still like him do you guys visit and the and the two-party system on facebook I, I, I've I'm never gonna been go to right that now. particular page, or it's probably a group. Uh, no, I haven't been to that group. Um, seems like a a. I mean, it's a, it's a great idea for sure. It would be amazing if even we just got rid of the Republicans and say the Green Party took over as the new Progressive Party. That would be an amazing sweeping change. That would that. Uh, it would be. It would be an amazing sweeping change, but that doesn't seem particular, particularly likely at this point because the Republican strategy is to block and to gerrymander their way into remaining in power, and Democrats will only give out as, as, as little as will keep them in power. But they really they like things as it is, too, by and large. All right. Let's continue on here. Back to the Russian Revolution. Not that they will succeed, however. But as I say, the revolution in Russia did not produce any organized and eff effective bourgeois resistance. For the simple reason that there was no real bourgeoisie or capitalist class in that country. <clears throat> Military attempts there were indeed. Such as that of the Tsarist General Kornilov to, to attack Petrograd with the Cossacks brought from the front, but so harmless was that adventure that Kornilov's army melted away even before he could reach the capital. His men went over the revolutionary garrison of Petrograd almost without firing a gun. The point is, is that when the masses are with the revolution, there can be no thought of a successful resistance by any enemy, no chance of suppressing the revolution. That's, that's no longer true. That may have been true of the, the world militaries at the time but u.s military i mean we spend more than the next however many 20 countries or something like that let's go w to the without, internet w without military support there's no chance of an armed revolution in the u.s succeeding the best that that a group could hope for would be a guerrilla movement and even then there's not that many places in in the U.S. where they could really pull that off because it, 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 it relies on having very remote uh, backcountry areas to fall back into. So unless we're talking about, say, like maybe West Virginia, there's not many other places you could really operate that sort of thing out of. The U.S. is just too infrastructured at this point. So what's, this, what's the stat there? The United States spends more money than the next top 11 countries combined gross 11 countries yeah it's not quite 20, yeah but but still it's not good it's not good 
We have very elite forces that would crush any armed insurrection against them. That's gross. Mm -hmm. Sorry for you, other guys. And it seems pretty far-fetched to me, too, to, uh, you know, bring any of sizable chunk of the military onto the, the leftist side. Um, there are definitely a lot of leftist veterans, uh, uh, left flank vets, great one on Twitch there to, to check out. But within the military, there's a lot of, I mean, indoctrination is bad enough within the U.S. in general, but it's even worse within the military. So things would have to get really bad. Things would, I mean, basically that's the only way I could ever see that strategy working. Which is why I personally prefer more of a prefigurative strategy where we, we use the, the rotting corpse of, of capitalism to shelter us from uh, would-be disruptors and, and just set about making the government and, and the sort of world that we want to live in. So, you know, always are so tired when you come on the show. So we, we would, you know, we could uh, form it around networks of mutual aid. We could take all the different uh, areas that are, are basics of life, things like education, housing, food, uh, transportation, um, those sorts of things, and form neighborhood committees around that. Give us a, a, a practice of, of direct action as well. Or, or direct democracy, I should say. So, so set up councils within your neighborhood, and then if things got big enough, uh, and other neighborhoods started making councils of their own, coordinate, you know, voluntarily coordinating with them. And the idea being that uh, the government's not providing these basics of of life, so we're going to do it where they're failing. And so that that. That brings a lot of buy-in to your movement. That gives people the the experience of running government in a more directly democratic way. And that begins to make the change that that we ultimately want to see. And and gives us a much more chance of standing if and when things do crumble. Because all, all governments crumble eventually. There's no empire that's eternal. Um, so... That's my preferred way of doing things because it doesn't require any sort of armed revolution. That's not to say that there wouldn't be violence because look what happened to the Black Panthers. They did basically that. They set up free clinic. They set up uh, a free school. They set up, you know, a, a uh, breakfast and lunch program. That was the, the main focus of their activities and they were violently repressed by the state, infiltrated by the FBI. Uh, I think J. Edgar Hoover, there's a lot of evidence that he personally made it his mission to destroy them. Um, so. And now that there's COVID, there's free breakfast and lunch in public schools. Yeah. Till the end of the school year. <laughs> well, I mean, COVID has, has revealed the, the strength of, of taking care of each other more collectively. Um, well, it's going to stop as soon as the struggle's over. It's over. Right, but that, I mean, it seems like that's never going to happen. The masks are coming off. From where we're sitting off. now. The masks are coming off. The and, the numbers are going, and the numbers are going up. They so. don't care. Well, okay. anyway, the point is it revealed a lot of shortcomings of just putting everything onto individual choices of getting vaccinated, washing your hands, wearing a mask, that sort of thing. So another thing that, that prefigurative... Um, building uh, dual power uh, prefiguratively does is it it reorients people's sense of community, their, their sense of duty to one another. It 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 makes them more collectively oriented, um, and they see the benefit of of living in that way as opposed to just getting what you can for yourself and screw everybody else. Oh, you're in West Virginia. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd still say West Virginia is probably the most inaccessible place in the U.S. 
I, that's my that would be my assessment of things so that would be really the only place that any sort of a guerrilla movement could uh, really thrive or be sustained or have any chances but even then it's 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 probably an impossibility um, <sighs> Man. Illinois stopping the indoor mask mandate in a few weeks. Governor said today, "Hey, there you go." <laughs> so, so at this point, they're yeah, they're dropping all the pretenses and and just letting people die. I guess <laughs> as long as we get back to work, that's what they really care about. Natural consequences. And, and that was really the the push behind uh, vaccines in the, in the first place. It was to make sure that people were still alive so they could work in businesses. Well, Joe said he's going to put some social security incentives in for folks who are suffering the consequences of long COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he did talk about that. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a difficult thing to, to prove. Um, I don't trust him. Yeah, I don't trust him either. He's, he's, he's fallen short on every single promise he's had. He's a good talker, but he don't walk the walk. I don't think and he's even that good of a talker. He just says, like, no. the bare minimum. But and... he's there's a lot of posturing, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get rid of the student loan debt. Wait, I can't get rid of the student loan debt. Oh. Yeah, I mean, there's always there's always some scapegoat to, to take the blame off of old Joe there. It's never his own fault. Never could have pushed pushed his own party harder. Never could have yeah, and then... pressured Pelosi to... to push things through or, or pressured cinema and mansion to get over themselves and stop <laughs> standing in the way of progress. Cinema and mansion just need to like register some sort of third party. Cause I'm tired of this. Like I'm a Democrat. Like, no, you're not. Yeah. yeah. You rarely that. Yep. Yeah. Which is fine, but just like own your shit. It's a different kind of place for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and all of, Appalachia is is a is in an interesting situation because they, you know they they keep feeding them, feeding feeding them that hope that things like coal jobs and manufacturing are going to come back and it's just not the case. Y'all need to pay because more. automation and and depletion of mines and machines can do it better, faster. You don't have to worry about. Yeah, that's not automation. All right, I'm trying right now. I'm really okay. tired. Okay, sorry. Um, and just out, you know, getting it from different sources around the world with, with laxer uh, work safety regulations and such. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, those jobs are never coming back. And right now, in fact, there are more jobs in, in solar power than there are in coal nationwide. So... Yep, exactly. Coal coal runs out eventually. It's a finite resource. So maybe if they just pray about it, some more will come. Don't you don't gotta be like that. I'm just kidding. Being mean. You I'm only gonna... marginally kidding, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm gonna get kicked off here in like a minute. What? You won't get kicked off. Probably have to fill out COVID survivor paperwork for doing No shit. Oh. Uh -huh. And they'll be like, oh, sorry, we have to take your refund. Yeah, fine. It's the next FDR. Well, that's the thing. At some point, I mean, the wheels are coming off of ne the neoliberal experiment. We're getting to the end of uh, people being able to be exploited and still be able to purchase the products that, that the economy demands that we do to keep it running. So, I mean... Minimum wage hasn't gone up in ten years, and it, and even then it was it's pitiful, gonna... and it's it's probably not going to. But at some point, there's going to be so many people out of work, or so chronically underemployed that the entire economic system is just going to collapse if they don't do something big. Mm -hmm. So there will, I think, there will be, and you know, right on the the hundred year mark, it, it's it's looking like, or right thereabouts, the you know the hundred year mark of the New Deal. It, there's going to be a need for another New Deal. Um, that will be the the, the okay. liberal way of, of like solving it. Improved deal. What? Nothing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it it would have to be something substantive. You have to send enough people back to work that the economy can get going again. It's iced tea. I got a bug in my iced tea. 
I think so. We we are we are plagued by uh, box elder bugs in our house. They love to nest during the winter. Yeah, it's so cute. Yeah, it's, it's annoying, but they're not hurting anything. Um, so yeah, so it's either going to be a new deal, or it's going to be a slip into fascism, or it's going to be an actual leftist revolution of one kind or another. I want it but to But something, be. well, I mean, I definitely want it to be the, the final one, but, but something's like, got to give eventually. It can't, it can't hold up much longer. It's so funny because, like, our school district has, like, all these para jobs, right? Paraprofessionals mm-hmm. with, like, thousands of dollars for sign-on bonuses, and no one will take the jobs. No one. It's like, listen here. Working in education is great because you get, like, the Monday through Friday life, right? Mm-hmm. We all aspire. Well, maybe we don't, but I feel a lot of people like the 9 to 5 life. So. Oh, you got stink bugs, Natalie? That's that's a lot worse than box elder. Oh. But you might not. I would assume you'd have box elder bugs in Illinois. But they're, the, they're like those red and black bugs. They cluster around box elder trees, which is it's a kind of maple tree. You may have seen it. It looks kind of like the classic maple leaf shape, but it's got a longer middle shaft. I'm sure you could hold one up to the camera. There's one on There's top one of the camera. There's one that might go in front of the camera and, and present itself for us. But yeah, it's those those black and red bugs. They're mostly black, and then they got like red streaks. Maybe I should pick around it up the edges. Shark. It's it's okay. It's okay. He wants he wants to be on camera. He's telling me. Yeah. Okay. Um. Anyway. Getting off track again, so let's get back on that horse. We're almost done with this chapter. So. That was a That's situation okay. in Russia in October 1917 when the Soviets took power into their hands. The Bolshevik plan was to gain entire and exclusive control of the government for their party. It did not fit into their scheme to re- permit the people to manage things through their Soviet organizations. As long as the Soviets had the whole say, the Bolsheviki could not achieve their purpose. It was therefore necessary to either abolish the Soviets or gain control over them. To abolish the Soviets was impossible. They represented the toiling masses. The Soviet idea had been a cherished dream of the Russian people for centuries. Even in the far past, Russia had Soviets of various kinds, and the entire village life was built on the Soviet principle, that is, on the equal right and representation of all members alike. The ancient Russian mir, the public assembly to transact business of the village or town, was one of the forms of the Soviet idea. The Bolsheviki knew that the revolutionary workers and peasants, as well as the soldiers, who were workers and peasants in uniform, would not stand for the abolition of the Soviets. Okay, so they keep throwing around that term Soviets, and and if your only exposure to the Soviets is in the in, you know through the Soviet Union, then it's important to uh, define it a little bit more. So Soviet is an elected local district or national council. Um, they said in the former Soviet Union, it doesn't have to just be in the Soviet Union. It's it's a a way of organizing people into a a, a governmental unit. Um, let's get an even better definition. Um, yeah, so an elected governmental council, but yeah, let's get into what kind of council that would be. Soviet council. So literally it translates to council in English. Political organizations and governmental bodies of the late Russian Empire primarily associated with the Russian Revolution, which gave the name to the latter states of the Soviet Union. Soviets were the main form of government in the Russian SFSR, free territory, and much less, to a much lesser extent, were active in the Russian provisional government. It also came to mean any workers' council that is socialist, such uh, as the Irish Soviets, that is socialist, such as the Irish Soviets. Soviets do not inherently need to adhere to an, uh, the ideology of the later Soviet Union. So the Workers' Council, according to the official uh, histor- historiography of the, the Soviet Union, the first Workers' Council, or Soviet, was formed in May 1905. Ivanovo 
northeast of Moscow during the 1905 Russian Revolution. He had a lot of revolutions at the beginning of the, the century there. However, in his memoirs, the Russian anarchist uh, Volin claims that he witnessed the beginnings of the St. Petersburg Soviet, blah, 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 blah. That, that's all background information that's not necessarily pertinent here. Uh, so Soviets emerged as, inclu as inclusive bodies to lead workers and to organize strikes and to politically and militarily fight the government of the Russian Empire, mainly through direct action. And with primary actors being non-totalitarian leftists, including socialist revolutionaries and anarchists, as Lenin's party was in the minority. During the time they established minor worker cooperatives, uh, though the, the operations were minor due to Russian crackdown on leftist organizations. Okay, let's see. So, so, I mean, from that definition, it sounds pretty similar to just a union, right? So it's, it's, it's labor and it's representation. Um, working as a political unit, what? I was talking about Leon Trotsky, and it made me think of a communist Valentine's Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's like Leon Trotsky uh, thinks you're Hotsky. Cute. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> the popular Sorry. organizations which came into existence during the February Revolution were called Councils of Workmen and Soldiers' Deputies. That's a really... I, uh, maybe it sounds better in Russian. Uh, the bodies were supposed to hold things together under the provisional government until the election of a constituent assembly could take place. So it would be like a council of councils. In a sense, they were vigilance committees designed to guard against counter-revolution. The Petrograd Soviet of 4,000 members was the most important of these on account of its position in the capital and its influence over uh, the garrison. So it's it's like a union plus a, a unit of, of, of military as well. At the beginning of the revolution, the Soviets were under control of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, and even the Mensheviks had a large share of the elected representatives, or a larger share of elected representatives than the Bolsheviks. As World War I continued and the Russians met defeat after defeat, and the provisional government proved inadequate at establishing uh, industrial peace, the Bolsheviks began to grow in support. By degrees, the Bolsheviks dominated with a leadership which demanded all power to the Soviets. Okay, so the, the Bolsheviks promised the worker government, uh, a worker government run by the workers' councils to overthrow the bourgeois, uh, bourgeoisie's main government body, the provisional government. In October 1917, the provisional government was overthrown, giving all power to the Soviets. John Reed, an American eyewitness to the October Revolution, wrote, Until February 1918, anyone could vote for delegates to the Soviets. So there you go. So, so this is a, a way that you're getting a uh, much more representative form of, of democracy. Uh, even had the bourgeois organized, uh, even had the bourgeoisie organized and demanded representation in the Soviets, they would have been given it. For example, during the regime of the provisional government, there were bourgeois representatives to the Petrograd Soviet, a delegate of the Union of Professional Men, which comprised, uh, which was comprised of doctors, lawyers, teachers, etc. So now you want to, should we go into the, the Trotsky part too, so you can giggle a little more? No, it's okay. So do you, do you have a, a better idea of what a Soviet is then? I mean, I had an idea before because I took Russian history yeah, yeah, in yeah. college. So we oh, talked about yeah, this. Then. Oh, look at you. I know all about the Soviets. <laughs> Fine. Only you can See? be funny. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, all right. So yeah, so that now you might now you should have a, a better idea of what he's talking about when he means, or what he means when he talks about the Soviets. There remained only one alternative in gaining control of them: 
Holding to the Lenin principle that the end justifies the means, the Bolsheviki did not shrink from any methods whatever to discredit and eliminate the other revolutionary elements from the Soviets. They carried on a persistent campaign of venom, venom and detraction for the other parties, of diluting the masses and turning them against the other parties, particularly against the left socialist revolutionists and the anarchists. Systematically and by the most Jesuitic means, they sought to become the sole power as to be able to carry out Lenin's scheme of proletarian dictatorship. By such tactics, the Bolsheviki finally succeeded in organizing a Soviet of People's Commissars, which in reality became the new government. All its members were Bolsheviki, with two minor exceptions. The Commissariats of Justice and of Agriculture were headed by left socialist revolutionists. Before long, these were also eliminated and replaced by Bolsheviki. The Soviet of People's Commissars was the political machine of the Bolshevik Party, which was now re-Christianed into the Communist Party of Russia. What this Communist Party stood for, what its objects and purposes were, we already know. It is openly avowed that its determination to, do, to secure exclusive Bolshevik domination under the label of the dictatorship of the proletariat. This was fatal to the revolution and its great aim of deep social and economic reconstruction, as the subsequent history of Russia has proven. Why? This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. And you can find you more it. Audible Anarchist on YouTube. I think the next chapter is pretty quick, but we'll probably leave it till the following week. We'll just move forward and see what we get. Yep, this audio. So the next one's only 12 minutes, but, but we'll save that for another time because we do tend to ramble a little bit. And we do See? both. Look at that. Both of us he do. He says, oh, we tend to ramble a little bit and then makes direct eye I do the same thing. Me. I'm, because we both do. I'm not, I'm not putting it all on you. I do it even when you're not here. I'm sure anyone who's seen more than one of my streams can attest to that. He does ramble. It's okay, though. So the next next week we're gonna we're gonna cover revolution and dictatorship. So that should be an interesting chapter, although it is quite short. It's gonna be. A I think I think a little bit of rambling can be fun because you you never know where you're gonna end up, and usually it's it's relevant stuff. Yeah. I'm I'm not. <laughs> This is my life, guys. I'm just looking for confirmation from you. I'm not putting it all on you. Jeez. This is, he's like, as soon as she comes in the room, it's over. It's done. Whatever. You I asked me to I, be I here. I don't think I ramble more. when He asked me to be here. I was doing things when I got home. I was making cupcakes. I had to take a shower. Wow. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> I think we'll probably wrap it up for the night then. Oh, okay. Oh, did you have any more you wanted to talk about? I mean, maybe. We'll ramble on. <laughs> so it was the first part of this. What was? What did I miss? He he was basically talking. He was just going through the the process of the revolution, more or less. Oh, okay. So he was talking about how the the Bolsheviks started out not having as much power as the Mensheviks um, or the other powers that were vying for control Mensheviks. during this interim period um which i i was under the impression that the czar had already been deposed but apparently that didn't happen until the october revolution um so in this interim period people were just trying to get themselves organized enough to, to see which one was going to actually make the make the, the cut the push and the mensheviks thought that the time was not right for, you know, socialist revolution, that the country needed to go through a period of economic and industrial development. Um, so that they had to, the best way was to uh, put up with capitalism for a period of time until the country was more modernized. And then at that point, they'd be ready to push to a socialist revolution.
Russia did a really good job, Same. like, industrializing themselves. Oh, absolutely. They had one of the best railway systems I mean, in China, the entire world yeah, for a China long period of time. China did the same thing. Of time. It's, it's amazing what, what a lot of these countries that, that chose uh, socialism achieved in, in the time that they were, or have been. But it don't know. work. Yeah, it don't work. It so. don't work. Yeah, Vuvuzela. What? That, that's the that's the meme. It's like because every time right wingers bring up, oh, what about Venezuela? So we're like, oh, Vuvuzela. <laughs> that's that's the the retort. Oh, okay. Fine. I'm not as in the loop as you. Okay. I know you're definitely not as online as I am. Yeah, and that's probably a good thing. Probably a good thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like having a co-host too. I always enjoy it when Amanda comes on. I think things are more fun to have. Someone to bounce ideas off and giggle with, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have laughed at that. I just was thinking about it earlier. We have trains in West Virginia, but just for coal. <laughs> <laughs> we don't use them for nothing else. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. I mean, if, I mean, if there's any place that really needs a good intercity mass transit system it would be a place like west virginia minnesota could step theirs up too though i mean every place in america could step theirs up i mean it's, it's pitiful china has spent the last 20 years putting bullet trains across their entire country we don't care about that here and you know instead we're we're still waiting on elon musk to do his hyperloop in california and he has a really terrible underground tunnel have you seen the video for that? I don't think I have. And Do you want to see the video for his his Tesla layer? his Tesla tube? Sure. <laughs> really stupid. So excited. I'm glad I'm sitting down for this. I know. <laughs> this is a thing. He's not kidding. Oh yeah, it's in it's in uh, Las Vegas. Oh, of course it is cuz No. Just, just just watch how how amazing how we will you know, you can really see we're living in the future now when, when you see this in action. You guys want to know some cool technology? Have you guys ever seen a QBO? A QBO? It's a robot and it has a sensor for a nose. And <laughs> no, it's really cool. They're very smart and they okay. can recognize other QBOs and they learn names and they can do things and they're really cute. So, so, so this is the boring tunnel. Um, is that what they're calling it? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it's the Boring Company. He's he's very clever. He's a very clever boy. He named his company the Boring Company because they bore into the ground. And they make they make tunnels that are only wide enough for a yeah, single I get Tesla. It. I get it. Okay, which one should we look at? Uh, so oh, let's do... Uh, we, can, we should do the majority reports. I'll bring it up on the big screen so everyone can hear. Stop. You didn't tell it to stop. You told it to go. I didn't. Stop. It wants... Oy. We don't shush Sam. I'll bring it up on the big screen. This will be a little treat for everybody. <laughs> Dildo space tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can't wait for that. Oh, man. You guys should ask Zach to tell you guys about his obsession with trains. Him and his brothers are obsessed with trains. Oh, if you ever, you should look up on, I guess it's on Twitch too, but but also on YouTube. <laughs> there's there's entire channels devoted to just filming from the, 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 uh, the front of the train, the engine room of the train. Yeah, you get super stoned and you watch trains. Yeah. No, we didn't get stoned, we just watched trains. Why are you trying to get me in trouble? You ain't in trouble. Why are you crying? God. How are you going to get in trouble? Because it's not legal in this state, for one thing. We don't, and we don't also know where that's we not... are. Twitch does. Twitch don't know nothing. Stop. I'm just kidding. Stop. And also, that's not what happened, so I don't even know what no. you're talking about. We got drunk and watched trains. Didn't get drunk either. We, we watched sober trains. I got drunk and watched trains. That may be true. Here's a... Elon Musk high-tech tunnel foiled by old-fashioned traffic jam. 
Yeah. Here we go. Oh, so now it doesn't. For those start of you who are um, Elon Musk uh, sycophants, we've got this for you. We got some footage of the agree, Vegas Tesla Hyperloop, ladies and gentlemen. This Hyperloop gives you the promise of being able to deliver human beings from one place to another. It's almost like a teleportation uh, <laughs> device. What it involves is the building of a... Um... Well, hold on. This, this is not even as good as his proposed Hyperloop. Because his Hyperloop, you'd put the car onto a little carriage, basically. and a the track? Car... No, it was like... It's like you're loading it up onto a, a tow truck, right? Mm. And so it holds onto your wheels and stuff. And then that goes through the loop super fast. But this is not even as good as that because you still have to drive it yourself. Uh, it's not a tunnel. It's a hyperloop. <laughs> okay. And it's, uh, is it underground or is it above ground? It's underground. It's, uh, you'll notice it's different from a tunnel in that it has rope lighting that changes colors. Yeah, it's okay. very futuristic. So it is not like a tunnel. Um, insofar as also like tunnels usually have a little bit more space than this, but this and exit and it, exit plans maybe. Exit, <laughs> yes, but with the hyperloop, <laughs> you'll see this is literally not wider than a single Tesla. So if there's ever a fire down in these tunnels, they say they they say they have contingency plans. Oh, we'll blow the smoke out real fast. You're gonna die down there. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> You know, and, and famously, Teslas have never caught on fire. So that, that's a good thing, too. Hit play, Zach. <laughs> Instead of driving your uh, vehicle through a tunnel and coming out the other side, in a Hyperloop, you drive your electric vehicle in and come out the other side. But the difference between this is, this is going to be, as opposed to a tunnel, this is going to be a way to avoid traffic that is happening on the surface whereas with a tunnel it it's not the same because it's different because it's underground and um now i know this sounds like what what kind of magical technology is this you're talking about we actually have footage of it though and it actually <laughs> works watch this uh this is a uh some video from the tesla hyperloop in las vegas no, no, James. The 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 dildo space train tunnel is, is phase two. That that's when he's gonna send all the poor people out into space so that we can mine asteroids and stuff for him to keep him rich in lithium and whatnot. Is it boring driving down here with all of this? All oh my gosh! Oh, you know what? When it's busy with new people, constantly, it's not too bad. Uh, but when it's slow and you're by yourself, it, it kind of gets a little boring. Sometimes. And, and by the way, only Teslas are allowed in this tunnel. No other cars are allowed down here. And Aww. still they have traffic jams. <laughs> so it costs them millions of dollars to bore these tunnels. Just circling around constantly. Look at all the scuff marks on all the sides, too. So is there often a lot of I think that's decoration? You no, know, I think what's happening is uh is the it? South Hall well, it looks terrible either the way. Building doors are closed. Oh they are? So no one's going to that. So I think what's going on is it's just these two and that's why it's just constantly uh, Why are they closed? I, I don't know. Well, like the building itself isn't closed, just the, the entrance doors are locked. <laughs> oh my god. I, I don't know why. Uh... So we've been dropping people off to Central if they want to go to South Hall. I don't know why. Well, I'm parked by the South Hall, so. I mean, I can, oh, I can, no. so, uh, you can drop me off. Yeah, people can still drop you off at the South Hall, but. And you're still picking people up over there. I, yeah, the I future. Call about that because I just got. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> they said it couldn't be done. <laughs> But there it is. It's uh, worth going back and looking at the original uh, plans for the Las Vegas Hyperloop. It wasn't supposed to be just for uh, Teslas. He promised giant buses that were supposed to whip through there with people like for their, I think it was like CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. And oh, it turns out it's just a car hole that puts uh, like my own proprietary, our own automobiles only on skates. And guess what? There's still traffic about it. And mm -hmm. if you also Google Tesla's Tesla car fire, 
these things go on in flames so often the batteries uh, are really flammable yeah, and it's, it's, i don't know i don't want it's it's lithium batteries the same ones that they had so much trouble with with that that particular was it an iphone or was it an android or was it a galaxy i think it was a galaxy that kept catching fire to the point where you can't bring them on airplanes anymore that's wonderful yeah same sort of batteries. Capitalism, so great. So great. Be caught in, I wouldn't go into those things if there weren't traffic, but the second that that slows down and I can't see the end of a tunnel in a Tesla, uh, that, I don't know, that's a recipe for uh, deaths, I think. <laughs> All right. Uh, we can see a more comprehensive view. So, so here, here's, here's as good as it can look. Well, as you descend the escalator into the loop station, I'm very there for her green outfit. Yeah, you can you can make it anything. Feet below it's like a walking now, green screen. Think, right, no, I was like talking about her way. outfit, like but like her yeah. outfit. It's, more it's, like a it's green. Yeah, I like it. So you can make it look like anything. Vegas? It could be pepperoni pizza this is also a thrill that she's wearing. Ride. That's where you were going with that. Cool. Thrill ride, part light and sound show. But mostly just a commute across a sprawling convention center. If there's a show going on, you can, you you can buzz it. <laughs> the future! <laughs> I'm sorry, but the word thrill ride to uh... fly down a beige hallway yeah. doesn't exactly sound like a thrill ride unless you're super fucked in the head. Oh yeah, I think it was a Galaxy Note phone. I think you're right about that. Yeah, a thrill ride is your going around. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> so glad. It's, it's basically the Jetsons. Oh my a god! Traffic, Please help me. Convention center. It can be a 45-minute walk from one end to the other. The loop gets you there in less than two minutes. Here's how it works: you enter the station and call for a Tesla. The system operates like an Uber or a Lyft. Uh, where you have an wow. You say, I'm here. I want to go there. Car comes up. So this is it. It's only got three stops and it still has traffic. On your phone. Passengers don't have to make multiple stops because there are multiple exits. You go directly to your station of choice. The convention center Whoa. is free, but plans are in the world to build a loop <laughs> system citywide. This I'm is the right dumbest now. thing <laughs> I've ever <laughs> seen in my entire life. Under construction. The stadium uh, is out there somewhere, waiting to be used. Out there somewhere. Are you saying that eventually this loop is going to connect people from the airport <laughs> to downtown to the stadium? And this this is supposed to project or portray in a good light. They're not going fast in any of these these uh, uh, videos of it. They're going like you know 15 miles an hour. Why don't they just build a subway? <laughs> Well, they could control the schedule of things. Never have traffic buildup. When you only have one lane, you don't have to. Con just, I, <laughs> God. <laughs> they just reinvented a, a subway for rich people so that they don't have to share the same air as the poor. Oh, That's basically what this is. I know. Rich people just keep reinventing stuff that already exists and call oh, it no. disruptive. Wow. It's incredible. I'm so glad I've seen it. in between? <laughs> it will. And that eventually it is will. far away. Construction on this loop was completed in two years for a cost of less than $53 million, <laughs> including the stations. <laughs> it's designed to handle 4,400 people Less than $53 million? Cars. Right now, with wait, wait, drivers... Oh. That was important. It's it's capacity. Let, let's see what it's it's pulling in at, at, at top capacity. Less than fifty three million dollars, including the stations. It's designed to handle forty four hundred people an hour with six. Forty four hundred people an hour. Wow. <laughs> That's like. A... <laughs> uh, let's look at people. Let's let's let, let's take an old line. Even let's take the New York subway. Uh, Piapple? Uh, yeah, I, I never claimed to be good at spelling. <laughs> Sorry. That was mean. This is why wealth is a problem when it's all concentrated in one spot because if it goes to the wrong person, we get some real dumb shit. Mm, per day. Okay. 
Here we go. Finding some some answers. So the New York subway system, which is over a hundred years old, a single NYC subway car carries two hundred two people. A typical NYC train has ten cars. An NYC subway station can handle thirteen trains per hour in one direction. That is a little bit more than 4,400 people. That's 52,520 people move per hour through a single subway station. A single subway station. I don't want to live here anymore. <laughs> you know, Bezos, if Bezos had his way, we I wouldn't. Know. <laughs> I know. I know. We would be living in, in a... Uh, uh, Oh, space, space camp yeah, for space losers camp. who have no money. We'd be we'd be belters from that one show. Did you say belchers? Belters. Um oh. you know that that space show that I watch. Sure. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. We made a shittier lower capacity subway station or subway system with only three stops that backs up continuously we have to wrap this up because i think i may seriously get like raged out here okay soon. Well, cars. Well. right now with drivers but soon with drivers cars. and what happens in vegas <laughs> <laughs> likely won't stay in vegas wow look how fast they're going has congestion issues uh needs to move people and really can't just keep expanding roadways is going to want to look at a system like this because it really makes a difference. Look, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, D.C. to Baltimore. Hey, Los Angeles to Las Vegas. That's a four hour plus drive that stretches into a nine hour parking lot on some days. All of this is under consideration for a loop in Las Vegas. More than 40 so destinations ridiculous. have raised their hands saying, yep, we want a station. We'll build it. I, they're thinking if you build it, they will come. And Shep. I bet they will. Contessa, thank you. Wow. Oh, did you see Shep Smith there? So excited about the the <laughs> Anyway, uh, here's here's the stats on uh, NYC. That just hurts. Like that's so painful. Like, I have all the money in the world, and I get richer every day. And $50 million for three stops. I'm going to build a low-pace, low-speed subway system for rich people. Cool. <laughs> so and that's the New York... And that, like I said, that's an over 100-year-old. Like, when did... Uh, let's, let's find that out, too. When did the... Uh, Let's see when they came out. 1904 began operation. Where do you see that? Okay, so 1904. Yeah. Almost a 120-year-old system has, you know, you might as well say infinitely more carrying capacity than uh, than this, this, this single Tesla line, which... I mean, consider this line, but there's a, a whole grid out to, you know, 40, 60 points in the city where any one of those those nodes could, could have congestion because we're still talking about cars. That's the advantage of having a, a mass transit system is because you can manage where the, the, the vehicles go. And so you can have a much higher capacity for that reason. This... With, with cars, they are always hampered by a lot of people wanting to go to the same spot at once. And because they take so much more vehicle to move that same amount of people, you get congestion. And because there's so many more routes uh, that, that one can take, they all end up bunching up in, in one place or another. It's basically a glorified merry-go-round. I know they put all the lights in there to just have the fact that it just sucks. I would feel so embarrassed having put that much money into that system and having it perform so poorly. And yeah, and it's yeah. only for Teslas too. Oh, what a world we live in. Elon Musk truly is the Tony Stark 
of of the modern era. No, he's not. He ain't helping no one. Okay. Tony Stark at least tried to help some people and did uh, have some empathy. I think at the end of the day, and a touch of compassion, but I don't. <laughs> I mean, my gosh, he named his kid after like symbol. Or, I don't. Oh, it was it was horrible. It's incredibly vain, egoistic move. Oh man. Well, that was a fun way to wrap things up. Yeah. Do you have anything more you want to say? No, I'm <laughs> just, just too mad upset now. now. <laughs> it's a merry-go-round for rich people, and I hate it, and I hope it blows up. I mean, it's only a matter of time before one of those Teslas catches fire down in there, and, and people are just... I mean, what do you do after that point? How do you even get a burnt Tesla out of that tube you at that point? You just sit there and go. If you, you send your boring machine back in there, and you just, you just grind it into the walls <laughs> so everyone that passes through afterward can... Maybe that's what the slits are for. It's like a vacuum and it just sucks all the incinerated <laughs> probably... Tesla ashes. Uh, sorry for... He pardon really pardon has... our dust. <laughs> he really has thought of everything. Uh, I wow. think maybe that he thinks that that's like the inside of his penis. Yeah, it just lights and, and, and music. And really fast. And it's a thrill really ride. Really fast. <laughs> all right yeah i'm mad any, any 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 parting thoughts did you did you enjoy this chapter of the book it kind of was a it was one of those chapters that sets up things for later more so than it was all right puts out there yeah I mean, this this is this is like the bad kind of rage because it's not even yelling it's just what the actual yeah right right yeah because some people don't deserve to have money they don't deserve it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't. <laughs> oh, you get, I'm so glad that I pay my taxes, though, so people like him can keep their money to build dumb shit. Feel yeah. really good about that. Oh, man. Okay, nope, I'm walking away. Yeah, you're going to get too angry. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for joining it's us. It's almost bedtime. Everyone I, say I goodnight to Amanda. We're going we're gonna to sign yeah, off, too. Yeah, you... So, yep, yep, <laughs> signing off now. You're gonna get in trouble. I, I hate him. So yeah, oh Elon Musk, he's the worst 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 human. Far and away. Um I I, I don't think we have quite enough people to, to rate anyone tonight. So maybe I'll just uh post a link to a, a cool Twitch creator who we would otherwise raid. No uh he's not on right now. He doesn't stream too often. That's because he's mad. I think he only does He got stressed out earlier. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, cause Vosh's fanatical fans are, are coming after him. Sorry, guys. For insulting their daddy. <laughs> daddy. Oh, they, they treat... <laughs> the parasocial factor with Vosh's audience it's is so off funny. the charts. And it's it's, it's, it's funny, if but it's not funny because it, it can be very damaging to people. I just want to be a debate bro, Zach. That's all I want. So, all right, so I'm instead of rating, I'll just recommend a, a Twitch channel for y'all. Y'all need to watch Noah Samson because he's funny. Yeah, Noah Samson, he's great too. But uh, nice guy, he's like the American Lance. Check out the Humanist Report. That's why does it keep making me log in? This is so ridiculous. Oh my God, something's going wrong with restream. So Humanist Report, really great channel. Go check them out. Uh, yep, glad you were here again, James. Uh, I'm glad you had a, a good time. Uh, you as well, Natalie. Everyone who joined us tonight, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm getting to be much less of a Vosh fan as, as time goes on. And I really see the, the toxicity of his attitude, really. Uh, and the, the, the complete lack of, of regard or care for anyone who... Uh, he doesn't have respect for, um, which tends to be a lot of leftists. There's, there's not that many that he gets along with. Um, so that's, yeah. And that's another issue is just how he feels like he can only be, he can be the only one as, as though, uh, leftist YouTube is, is the Highlander and there can only be one left at the end of things. Um, which is a bad feature of, of a lot of the debate bro mentality is, is they, they, they feel that they actually feel that they're in the marketplace of ideas and that they have to fight 
until their ideas are the only ones that are accepted anymore. There's a lot wrong with, with that sort of thing. That's not to say that all debate bros are, are bad. There's definitely better faith actors. Um, I, I like Ben Burgess a lot. Uh, Shark 30, uh, Shark 300 or 30. I never know how to, to say his name. Um, he's a great one too. Uh, Demon Mama usually is, is pretty good. Um, Joe Lewis on, on Twitch, really good one too. So they are out there. It's just uh, the, the, the earliest crop, the ones that, that seem to have come from Destiny have uh, a lot more of, of Destiny's sort of bad uh, characteristics. Uh, you know, so those are the, it, it, is, it is that group of them, that, that Vosh, Xander Hall, uh, that whole faction of, of people. Um, so yeah, yeah. Left, left, leftist, leftism, leftist movement should be about unity, not alienation. Where I mean, there's so few of us already, why alienate entire communities and cause fractures and and whatnot? At the, at the very least, don't be condescending if someone disagrees, but instead try to you know educate them if you really feel they don't understand things, instead of just deriding them. And that's what Vosh often does. You just go. Oh, and that person's a dumb fuck. I was just too stupid to even have a conversation with. I've heard him say that several times right after he gets done debating another leftist. And I don't see how that's beneficial to the movement at all, at all. Um, and that just signals his community to, to go after them. Whether or not he says the words, that, that, that is how they interpret that. And so, well, he doesn't take any responsibility for what they do. I think that's uh, that's disingenuous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would agree with that, James. All right, uh, let's end the stream for tonight. And uh, it's like what happened with to Christianity. Now we have hundreds of offices. Yeah, that definitely can be the case too. <laughs> Factionalism is is a bad thing for for pretty much any movement um, when it, when it becomes breakaway movements you know we, we cannot accept this one little discrepancy in, in dogma so we must now break away entirely and present ourselves as the, the one true carrier of, of the, the faith or the, the philosophy uh, anyway that's enough yakking for tonight um, depending on my work schedule tomorrow I may do some some more Witcher 3 play where I just kind of Play the Witcher Three and and you know hang out and it's more of a, a chill stream. Um, and tend to just kind of talk about whatever with whoever shows up. Uh, but if I don't get off early enough, then I will be doing that on Friday. So that'll be my next stream. If if not tomorrow, but I hope to see you all there. Uh, and and definitely hope to see you all for the Sunday stream. I think I think I'm I'm. I'm trying to decide between a couple different podcasts to, to cover. I really liked covering that that Seeing White series that, that talked about uh, how whiteness was created and, and for what purposes it was. So you may go through uh, episode three of that. Um, or there's, there's uh, a couple other ones that I, I might try. But it'll be something. It'll be something fun either way and, and educational. All right. I hope you're here too, James. Glad to have you. All right. Have a good night, everybody.